Hi there, I am David Agus. Um, I'm a professor of medicine and engineering at the University of Southern California. And together with the forum, we welcome you and congratulate you for uh, surviving till two o'clock on a Friday. <laughs> Um, and we hope to keep your energy up with this session. And I think when you hear the content and the depth of the speakers around it, I think you'll all get very excited too. So we're at a transition point in our field. Um, we're starting to see the outpatient side where no longer are doctors the collector of data. The patient is becoming the collector of their own data. Patients are checking their blood pressure, going in with three months of a supply. They have their movement. Pretty soon they're going to prick their finger and send in a biochip to the doctor. So the doctor's office visit can actually be something we all dreamed about, which is actually talking to the patient rather than collecting data. The inpatient, the hospital side, is always slower to uh, respond, but obviously critical. Most people experience hospital stays at critical events in their life, acute stays. When you're born, when you have a child, when you get acutely ill, I will tell you most of my patients are never hospitalized. So from when they're diagnosed with a cancer to if they fall, uh, uh, fail the cancer and you know, ultimately die, many times they're never hospitalized. That being said, surgical procedures, um, something we all go through, and the hospitals hopefully are going to change. And I think you'll hear perspectives here that gives you a whole new framework for the power of what a hospital could be and will be and probably should be. So I first want to introduce the panelists because you know their perspectives because classic forum style, it's a very broad range of people from all different disciplines and I think each bring a unique perspective. So starting uh, on my left is uh, Thomas DeRosa who is the CEO of Welltower and I'll let him tell a little bit about himself. So Welltower is a $40 billion public company that is the largest platform in senior care. We own over 1,400 buildings in the US, Canada, and the UK. Um, and then we, but we also treat and care for 250,000 frail to demented elderly, generally 85 and up, at any given moment in any day. Our other business is what we call outpatient medical. We own 16 million square feet of outpatient medical buildings throughout the United States. What we don't own is a hospital, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, going around in a uh, uh, clockwise fashion, Shamshir uh, Vialil is the managing director of VPS Healthcare, which is based in the UAE. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm a radiologist by training. When I started to work, I realized that uh, I should not be confined to the basements of hospitals. So. And, you know, I was born into a business family, so blood was into business. So I wanted to start one hospital. So the first hospital I started in Abu Dhabi, and then uh, that was nine years back. Now we see almost 12,000 patients a day, and we do only hospitals. So we have hospitals, uh, the clinics, uh, manufacturing facilities. So we believe in an integrated model. And uh, we feel that hospitals have changed. And I feel that in the next 10 years, you would see changes what you would not have seen in the last 100 years. So we Great. Excited. Well, we're excited to hear what you think those are in a few minutes. Thank you. Um, next, uh, clockwise, is Sean Duffy, who is the co-founder and CEO of Omada Health um, in the US. Um, yes, I'm Sean. So Omada, you can think of, funnily enough, almost like a digital hospital uh, for participants and patients who are at high risk of diseases like diabetes, thanks to obesity. Um, where the in-person programs that have shown to be effective clinically are just hard to get to. You know, the research shows that you can make a big difference if you catch people right before they tip into chronic diseases like diabetes, but it requires multiple touch points, you know, weekly sessions, lots of in-person visits, you know, social support. So we've architected those same principles, uh, but online we match people into <coughs> groups, uh, bring them on a curriculum, mail them hardware, and just make it so that we come to them where, you know, where they are and people tend to live their lives in front of their screens, so we figure that's where we should uh, uh, capture them and, and help them. And we've, you know, over the past five years, uh, become actually the biggest uh, provider of these digital interventions uh, in the U.S., and we are still just getting started, which tells you how far there is to go in the healthcare system in the country. That's great. Um, next is Betsy Nabel, who is uh, one of the uh, greats in the field of cardiology, um, who uh, had a leadership position at the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute. And HLBI, and now leads one of the premier medical institutions, Brigham and Women's, uh, in Boston. Thank you, David. Um, I uh, probably represent uh, the academic integrated health delivery system among the panelists here. Um, I would say that we, like other academic centers, 
provide four functions. We provide exceptional care to our patients from prevention to acute illness to post-hospitalization. We engage in innovation and discovery through our research programs. Uh, we educate the next generation of medical and scientific leaders. And we serve our community locally and globally. And uh, I will argue that those four functions can be served regardless of the structure. All right. <laughs> Um, and last, we have Sarah Doherty, who is the co-founder and chief technology officer of, this is the longest word we have on our sheet here, <laughs> telehealth robotics. Well, we firmly believe that the title of a business should tell you a lot about what it does, and that's exactly what telehealth robotics does. We build uh, and pair remote uh, technology to enable uh, healthcare services around the world. So we have a software system that a healthcare provider can log into anywhere in the world. Uh, they can interact with a patient remotely to do telepresence, and then they can also use the controls of the software, like a video game, to guide a robotic kiosk that can be dropped anywhere in the world to provide services like remote ultrasound, eventually remote primary care, ear, nose, and throat exam, and a range of other diagnostic services. So um, talked a little bit about behavioral health-wise, bringing the hospital to everyone, and we'd like to do that with hardware and diagnostic services. So break through that computer screen, that uh, phone uh, to allow for actual sort of physical exam uh, wherever a patient is. So the, whether that's a long-term care facility, a prison, a hospital that wants to, through an integrated delivery network, uh, better labor resource share, um, a remote island like we were talking about before, a lot of applications for delivering care that is for the right patient at the right time at the right cost. So as you see, we got very different backgrounds. Um, you know, we're seeing these trends in hospitals right now. I have two patients today that are ongoing prostatectomies at our hospital, and they're outpatient. So they're going home after the prostatectomy, which, you know, 10 years ago, that was a five to seven day stay at minimum. And we're seeing that transition. At the same time, obviously, we're still seeing lots of dollars being poured into hospitals. So let's start with an open-ended question. Um, 10 years from now, so in uh, uh, 2027, 20, uh, where are we going to be? I mean, so when I go into a major city, so let's right now talk about major cities. So a major city in a developed country, I go into a hospital in 10 years, what's it going to be like? I think it's going to be very different from what you see today. You know, think about, I'll take you to New York City. My two eldest daughters were born in the same hospital, in the same wing, on the same floor as their great-grandfather 100 years earlier. Wow. And if I wanted to take them to see that hospital today, they would be looking at one of the new luxury condominium buildings um, that has been developed in the West Village of New York City. And that hospital was St. Vincent's Hospital. And St. Vincent's Hospital was on the front line of the AIDS epidemic uh, back in the late 80s. And its physical plant could just not deliver modern medicine today. I recently met with the CEO of a major hospital in a major city in the United States. And he said to me, just so you know, you can't get a Wi-Fi signal in 60% of this building. How do we deliver modern medicine when you can't get a Wi-Fi signal? So I think the world is changing. 10 years, we're going to look very different. I think uh, 10 years from now, uh, you won't see standalone hospitals, according to me. I think it would become part of life. You would have uh, uh, people walking into a hospital, drinking coffee, having business meetings, uh, doing their gyms. Their iPhones would be their primary doctors. They would have their data connected on to a central uh, artificial intelligence uh, kind of a stuff. They would be getting continuous advice. So I think even today, if you take a prostatectomy, which you were talking about, it's all done by robots. Mm -hmm. And you have the skills, the, uh, the doctor stays. But I think the dependence on artificial intelligence and data is going to be much larger. So I think there will be a complete shift. There will be democratization of healthcare. You would have people in the center, not the physicians or the hospitals. So I think we are here for some exciting times. <coughs> you asked, uh, you know, 
10 years you walk into a hospital, what's that experience like? And I think you've got to ask also why you're there and what you're there for. And I think 10 years from now, you're gonna be walking for something very specific and you might need a hernia surgery. And the hospital is maybe not that large, but that is just what they do. They do hernia surgeries. And how you got there was a digital mostly experience where you, you know, maybe felt some pain, you, you know, open up your phone, you view that experience as primary care. You file a ticket, it gets routed, maybe you get you know, some diagnostics at a small center that collects any physical specimens that they need that's routed, maybe you see someone and then you're sent to this hospital. And I think all the data systems so you're will be connected. verticals. I think, I think that's where it's gonna go. I think it's gonna be special, in urban centers, specialist verticals where volume matters for outcomes. That's great. I would reframe the question as well and ask in 10 years, why do you think you need to go to a hospital? Uh -huh. And I would redefine a hospital um, as a center where an individual is likely to undergo some type of invasive procedure for which they might need an extended period of continuous monitoring. And that is best served by having a group of experts who can provide that monitoring. Um, and so it, it may be a vertical Right. Uh, care center as you've defined it. Uh, but where we would like uh, to take our health delivery system is as much into the home and into the community uh, as possible. Why? Because we think we can deliver better care at lower costs. If you believe in value-based health care, right. the definition being outcomes, patient measured outcomes, not process outcomes, but patient measured outcomes defined by cost. Uh, we believe that outcomes will be better delivered at home in the community at much lower cost. That's great. So I'd take you up on your why question also, and, and my answer would be that the very name of a hospital creates a huge issue in healthcare, right? Largely because people think that's the only place you go to get healthcare and to think about your health, and they only think about their health when they're going there, right? So there are so many solutions already out there in the market, like Omada, like others, that allow you to take charge of your health in your home. Um, but we have a kind of technology gap, you know, an education gap around those tools that are available. Um, and I, my opinion is that I think we're no longer going to have hospitals. We're going to have points of care. Uh, whether it's in your home, it's your local community center, it's your pharmacy, um, it's your school or your workplace, uh, and that's kind of core to the technology we're building, that it's, you know, kind of drop clinic. Uh, you do see a lot of clinics now that are on your street corner, but the limitation that they have, similar to the limitation of a hospital that you go to, is that they're uh, only available the people who have expertise that are stationed there. And so what we think is that they're having a virtual pool of providers who are available to each point of care, whether it's at your home through your phone or at your local community center through a kiosk like telehealth robotics. You have this pool of physicians who work across the country and across the world, and you can get availability from a cardiologist and then an endocrinologist and then a nurse practitioner to manage your chronic disease one right after the other. So I would say not only are we going to change from the physicality of hospitals, but we're also going to change from the localization of physicians to a particular hospital, instead having physicians share their expertise around the world. So, Sarah, in your distributed model of labor, how do you ensure quality? That's a good question. So, you know, I think initially we're working on partnering with leading um, institutions to share that labor resource. Um, and, you know, we'll still have to go through the same qualification that physicians go through now, right, in working with leading academic medical institutions. You know, I think as we look more towards commoditizing uh, the practice of medicine, that will become a big issue. And uh, we'll have to think a lot from a regulatory standpoint and also from an edu education standpoint, how we make sure that we have sort of equal quality of care across that network. Betsy, you know, now you're in a hospital, one of the best in the country, that's considered really, not exclusively, but a tertiary care hospital. Mm -hmm. The craziest, hardest cases are sent to you. In your model of the future, are you gonna be much more primary care in not just Boston, but spreading out, or are you refining in one area? Yeah. We, we, are, we are gonna be both. We certainly are gonna be very much primary care um, but we also will remain tertiary care. And when I say we, I want to include Brigham Women's Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital, we're mm -hmm. partners healthcare system. We are 60% referral, primarily regional, but national and international as well. But having said that, 
um, we believe very strongly um, in the power of the personal relationship between an individual and their health care provider to deliver good health, to provide outstanding outcomes, um, and to build a lifelong relationship that will foster health and wellness. I, I want to uh, commend an article that appeared in the New Yorker this week by Atul Gawande, mm -hmm. who is a surgeon at our hospital. And he talks about, as a surgeon, he was trained to cure people, episodic, one-time cure. But as he has stood back, he's realized that most improvements in health and wellness occur through incremental medicine. And he gives several examples in this article and talks very eloquently that our future is really about the relationship that we have with health care providers. So I, I believe very strongly in digital technology as important tools that we will utilize, that they will overlay on our electronic medical record to help health care providers better deliver uh, their, their care. Um, but I, I'd love to hear the two of you talk about wh what's the role of the relationship with the health care provider. Yeah. You know, I'll just say, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you talk, and, and I would talk to um, Atul Gawande when he was here yesterday in this mm -hmm. same circle, mm -hmm. and we were talking about uh, work he's doing in Estonia related to community health care workers. And I mm -hmm. said to him, you know, what's the role of telemedicine? Mm -hmm. Because a big part of the uh, work they're doing is relationship focused. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that that's an important part of this. And in some ways, we'll be able to better enable uh, phys or physicians and, and uh, patients to connect because hopefully that physician will be freed up by the artificial intelligence and the better use of their bandwidth to connect with patients who want to connect with the same person each time. So instead of you know having uh, having to wait because someone's late or someone cancels, you can connect in you know maybe to someone a patient that you've seen before who is waiting to see you. But the alternative side of that is there are so many people without access, and I think you know that's sort of the baseline. It's great to have that relationship, and you do see impact that comes from that. Um, but below that, we have all these people who are not able to get access to, to care. And so I think that's probably, for me, the problem that we have to solve first is access and then relationship building. And, and so, so you're developing a system that, in a sense, is data-driven, has outcomes, but the reliance on the physician is less than many healthcare systems. Well, though I, we always call it high tech and high touch because I do not think we could get any clinical outcomes in our program without people that, as part of the system. I mean, we match people into groups, social relationships, feeling loved, supported, like you're not alone. As you go through this change, is critical. Having a coach kind of providing oversight, accountability, motivation is critical. And I do think, I completely agree with you, I think the brand efficiency, the relationship that folks will have with whatever the system, whatever their, their view of primary care is tomorrow will be critical. And we're almost like a specialty center where we'd be referred, you know, a practitioner would say, hey, you know, you're at risk for diabetes, there's this program, and route through the EMR to AMADA, and then we feed data back. Um, the only area where I might, um, you know, imagine, uh, you know, a world that could be different than what it is today is I think, Right now, when people talk about that emotional feel with healthcare that can deliver on outcomes, they tend to think of that as a person. And I actually think that tomorrow's world is gonna be a brand. You're gonna grow incredible trust with a brand and a system. And all the associated people will be able to know you in context of that brand in a way that makes them feel like you know, part of your team. And, and, you know, and that, that is how you'll view kind of your locus of, of care, in my opinion. And I would add to that, because the concept of brand. Today, if you want to access the Brigham and Women's brand, you need to live in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I foresee a day where someone who lives in Chicago who wants to affiliate with Brigham and Women's mm -hmm. can do that and do that on a local basis. We may live in, we may see it one in the future, a Brigham and Women's ambulatory care outpatient medical facility in Chicago, so, but today, so if what you is the brand to, though? What the brand is a style of medicine? The brand it's a treatment is, the, algorithm. is the quality of care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the reliability, the dependability, the trust that if you touch Brigham Women's Hospital, actually, Tom, you 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 are prescient uh, because uh, just this week we are relaunching ourselves as Brigham Health uh, because we believe very strongly in focusing on 
health and wellness. We maintain and we restore health. And wherever you touch us around the world, you can receive that same reliable, dependable, high quality of, of care. No more women? <laughs> we're, we're keeping the hospital name locally because we've had so many babies born at our yeah. hospital. In fact, Sarah said you were, born you were born there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will never give that up. But, but if you hire a new doctor, I mean, do yeah. they get? Do they go on a lot of computers and say, "Here, here's how the Brigham and Women doctors treat X disease"? What What is the brand? The The, the brand is the um, is the apprenticeship that a trainee comes and gets embedded in the secret sauce <laughs> of dedicated teaching. And I'm looking at Dr. Jeff Drazen, who was one of my teachers when I was a house officer. That has gone on for over 100 years. So it's not treatment pathways. It, it, is, it, it is a value system that says, as a healthcare provider, whether you're a physician, a nurse, a social worker, uh, a pharmacist, this is a, a, a value, it's a culture, it's a value system. And in th those values are then embedded, linked with standards of care that are best practices, that are evidence-based, and have been shown to produce exceptional patient outcomes at a low cost, at the lowest cost possible. Great. But and I have a different, sorry, yeah. I have a different view on this. Uh, you know, in healthcare, we always talk about two things quality and safety. <laughs> I think it's a kind of oversell because that has become part of the game. There is nothing which goes without quality and safety. Mm -hmm. But what is the value coming with it? Because today we have a problem. The, the cost is going up and the value is coming down. And that's only happening in healthcare. You take manufacturing. There's always uh, the profitability which increases with the fourth industrial revolution. But here, the hospital operating margins are coming down. It's almost reached six to seven percent. Uh, you go for a uh, IT implementation, even I believe partners mm -hmm. ended up uh, in a loss with their new installations. MD Anderson laid off 900 people. We have tried affiliates from our part of the world. We have tried multiple partners, but there is no standardization. We couldn't live with any partner for more than two or three years because what happens in US doesn't apply to the Middle East or uh, Africa. So I think we need to look at it from a global perspective. Mm -hmm look at it mm -hmm. as a universal health record rather than sub-focusing on one recipe which nobody knows. I don't think you can explain what is your secret of your success, yeah. not your uh, from the 100 years. So I think we need to value what it is. We need to see what is the recipe. We need to do data analysis. Why somebody coming out of Brigham is 10 times better than coming from somewhere else. So I think well, that's what I'm yeah. trying to push at. I mean, how do you be yeah. iterative and data-driven yeah. if there's it's a secret sauce? Yeah. Well, can I, well yeah. I, I, I want to... Um, uh, I, I want to clarify, because I would say, so I'm sorry, that the secret sauce may be applicable to our region in the United States, but that's, that's, that's a right. geographic region. Yeah, yeah. Your secret sauce is going to be very different, yes. uh, because it's going to be culturally uh, dependent. Right, yes. um, the, the degree to which we can partner together right, yes. and share our secret sauces and figure out where the commonalities are, mm -hmm and respect our differences. That's right. To me, that's the opportunity. That's right, I think, yeah. One other thing I'd add to the brand question, you know, the, for hospitals that approach us and are interested in working with technologies like ours, um, their brand focus is actually on innovation. So how can you show your patient population that you're at the cutting edge in terms of optionality from a treatment perspective, reinventing medicine and, and treatment plans? And I think that, you know, for businesses like ours, that will be a big part of you know, why people come, right? They're interested in different ways to approach their healthcare and also why we might partner with health systems to get a prescription essentially. So, you know, maybe you need chronic care management or maybe you need chronic ultrasounds, right? Because you just had a procedure and you need follow-up care. How do we kind of work with hospital systems to uh, focus in on that component of brands, which I think now, as technology becomes more and more important in attracting patients and differentiating yourself in a metropolitan area uh, from other hospitals, uh, we see that as really driving a lot of hospital um, sort of brand focus. So brand focus based on technology, not just on the secret sauce and the culture. Well, I think they're sort of integrating that into their secret sauce, right? So we also see a lot of trainees that kind of work with us in some of our clinical trials 
And they're being encouraged to think in an innovative way about the treatment plans that could be delivered, you know, not saying no right away to a, a um, disease state that traditionally couldn't have been treated, and also giving optionality for the way that you might approach your health care and your follow-up from a hospital visit, right? So, you know, I, we were talking with uh, people from Kaiser Permanente, and they said that 50% of the people that they work with opted into a telemedicine visit, right? So if you are able to provide a lot of ways that people can interact with your healthcare system, uh, I think that's starting to be a big part of uh, marketing opportunity for hospitals right. from a brand yeah. perspective. They're talking about healthcare um, like a consumer product. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very interesting because traditionally healthcare has, I think, at least in the US, been thought of as an entitlement not necessarily a, um, a consumer choice. You went to wherever you were told to go. And that may, you know, I think what you're hearing today is, mm -hmm. is really changing. More it's much more time. obviously targeted to bigger cities where there's a lot yes. of choice. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have a business model that basically your business model is stay away from them. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and so it's a very interesting dynamic, right? Your goal is to keep the patients out <clears throat> from their hospitals. Exactly. And I mean, it's working. I mean, it is obviously. working. We we take what is the most at risk population for the Brigham, mm -hmm. the 85 and up frail to demented. That is, uh, they are the largest consumers mm -hmm. of acute care. Mm -hmm. And Betsy used a word that I always use: it's wellness. Mm -hmm. So, what is it that we do? We provide wellness to this population. What is that? That is nutrition. It's hydration. It's physical mobility, it's socialization, cognitive engagement to the extent that that mind can be cognitively engaged. And one of the big diseases, we attack one of the biggest diseases that affects this elderly population, it's called safety. Because that 85 year old with dementia is one fall away from a cascade of healthcare issues that land that individual on the doorstep of the Brigham. And they become a very complicated, expensive, low margin to money losing proposition for the hospital. Yeah. So we're trying to prevent that. And in the US, this is a private pay model. So people, our population, those 250,000 people that we're taking care of right now are paying out of pocket and they're paying dearly for it between $8,500 a month and $20,000 a month. I think uh, I would, sorry, I, I would say the, the, the work that Tom is doing is one of the best partnerships that, that I could have. Um, there's nothing that uh, I think uh, our, our care provider community wants more uh, than to people, than for our, our, our patients, um, our individuals we care for, to be well outside of the traditional hospital. Because by the way, a month in your place is a day in her place. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that's that's a, a major reason. Exactly. Major reason why. But I think we should be talking about scalable models. I think we should talk about disruptions. And healthcare industry is very risk averse because of the issues of quality, safety. Ten years back, who would have thought Apple would be so keen on healthcare? So I think the uh, disruption would come from outside of the industry because we think so conventionally. We still mm -hmm. think about fall or <coughs> dementia. We want somebody like them to come forward with uh, new ideas, new technology, mm -hmm. which could lead to disruption. And I think that's what we are all waiting for. Otherwise, we won't see a hospital of the future. I think after 10 years, we would still uh, see Brigham only in the US or confined mm -hmm. to Boston. But what we want is across the globe, a chain which can make things work standardized mm -hmm. protocols, clinical safety guidelines, we can reduce the cost for governments. That's a big issue right now. Because when we go to any governments, they're asking what is the value? What is that you can reduce the cost? So we need to answer. I, I, one more question, I want to go to the audience for more questions. Um, each of you have a system that basically generates data. Um, mm -hmm. So you could say we're also involved in care and value care and helping people, but you're generating data. Historically, we've never used that data. Yep. Um, historically, you know, that data is in, you know, lots of trees that have been cut down and made into little pieces of paper. Um, we now, through lots of convergences, have the ability potentially to use that mm -hmm. data and actually to get better and to yes. improve. Yes. 
And so what's your viewpoint? I mean, where do you think it's going to go? Are we really going to be, you know, when you search on Google, your search mm. today is better than your search yesterday. Yep. When we treat a patient, or I treat a patient, it's the same as it was decades ago. I think it's a very big deal. Um, actually, just this morning, we crossed 13 million weight readings at Omada longitudinally after three years. It makes us the biggest longitudinal data set of these programs in the world. And what I always say, especially in our space, where most of the solid science is in person, you can't sit as a fly in the wall of every in-person program and use your insights quantitatively to make it better. So this is an area where we've invested quite heavily. We have a very robust data science team. Every single product initiative that we put has a paired data scientist that architects a product change as a Real, uh, real, so as what's a randomized a experiment. What's their background? Well, the person who leads our team was a particle physicist, right? Was at CERN looking for the boson, found the boson, <laughs> called it a day. <laughs> like, well, what, what do I do next, right? And then was a, a radiation you know, physicist for, for a while, and then, you know, and then wanted to get out to the valley and explore this and that. Very atypical background for uh, you know, what, what we do, but that's who runs our data science team. And it's having massive, massive power because you don't put a program like this in the oven, set a timer, or hear a ding, and call it a day. Like, you are always making sure that every single person in your program now is making the program better for tomorrow's join. And they're all consented the data. I mean, that's obviously a complex mm -hmm. issue. Well, and all the, that's right. And all analytics are done, you know, anonymously. You don't need to, you don't need to kind of provide, uh, you know, unit, individual level data in, in that when you so make the So nobody knows changes. who the data scientist is. It's anonymous. Uh, no, no, no. The, the, <laughs> but I think privacy is going to be a big issue. I think cyber, cyber security, we need to talk about encryption of these data. Mm -hmm. yes. As you know, an electronic health record would cost more than 100 times of your credit card. So we need to be careful ab about standardizing, securitizing, privatizing. You know, the, the privacy should be maintained. So that's a good point to think about. I, I would argue that um, uh, the individual, is, is, the health data belongs to the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, I, I would challenge Sean and Sarah to think about how uh, an individual who might have had an inpatient experience at my hospital goes to one of Tom's facility for extended care, travels to UAE and, and visits one of <laughs> Sean Sears' facility, um, and then touches both of your technologies. How is that person going to integrate mm -hmm. all of that information in a way that if they <coughs> touch another facility or touch one of us again, yeah. they've got all of that material. Well, we're a, we're a covered entity by the, the HIPAA law, which is the law that regulates you know, data privacy and security. So explain what that is again. Uh, we, we, we treat our data as, as if we are a hospital. Our, ter our interpretation of HIPAA is that we are a covered entity, which actually allows for interplay and, di and work mm -hmm. between hospitals in totally new ways. And our licensure model is at mm -hmm. the person level. Our participants mm -hmm. own our data. We have a license to it because we need to use it, but that's where we put the licensure model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I would just, excuse me, I would just respond and say, you know, I think for interactions with the kiosk that we intend to maintain, mm -hmm. there's sort of optionality there. So if mm -hmm. we're working within a hospital system, we would be providing the hospital system with that information, but there's still mm -hmm. obviously a huge issue with, you know, sort of universal EHR, yeah. and also mm -hmm. with PHR, right? So how do we build a technology? So electronic health record. And, and personal pay. health record, Got yeah. It. So, um, you know, in that environment, I think that becomes very difficult. In an environment like a community center, it's a totally different model, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you um, provide that information directly to the patient? And that's something that we're thinking a lot about. So can the patient get their ultrasound now? So you mean get their their image? Yeah. So the image is less important than the diagnostic endpoint, right? And that's what we're trying to think a little bit about, you know, with that virtual. Well, pool I mean, what of if providers. I want to take it to another doctor yeah. to look at it? What if I want yeah. to show? Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, we're we're on the earlier stage of things. Um, more interested actually from a data perspective right now in how we uh, create the best exam. And over time, we'll have to think a lot about how, where that exam is delivered. I think right now, our focus is in the hospital environment. And so, you know, that's where we're going to be providing those images um, and looking to partner with hospitals that uh, prioritize providing that data back to patients. Um, but eventually, you know, as we move into different spaces, I think that'll be important. The other thing I just wanted to mention is from a data perspective, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to, you know, like you were mentioning, um, improve the interaction and improve the treatment. So we are looking at ways to use data and artificial intelligence uh, between patients to make that experience in getting an ultrasound, for example, quicker, more efficient, um, helping the remote physician better interact, to your point earlier, 
with the patient while they're doing the exam and not have to worry as much about the controls um, and artificial intelligence solutions and data from previous patients uh, will help us with doing that. We need the data to drive outcomes. You know, how do we know we're achieving a good outcome if we don't have good data? Uh, I live in a sector that has not used data historically, and we've just uh, partnered with the Johns Hopkins Health System to establish data protocols around our resident population because we know we are uh, achieving fewer visits to the mm -hmm. ER mm -hmm. at Brigham mm -hmm. and shorter length of stays mm -hmm. when someone is admitted to a hospital mm -hmm. bed. Mm -hmm. And we need um, the uh, well-recognized um, data protocols so we can use this data and share this data. And so it's early days, but we're, we're, we're making an investment so, and I love that, and, but are you in that data set you have, is it fragmented, or do you get the Brigham's data? When a patient's admitted to the Brigham, they come back to you. Does that data go back to you, and you put a more uh, complete picture? It probably not as efficiently as it should, and we're working towards that. Okay, yeah, that yeah. I think interoperability is a big, big thing right yeah. now, because it's, I'm sorry. interoperability yeah. of system, because your system doesn't talk to the system you have and doesn't talk to my system. Yeah. So I think uh, we need to standardize electronic health records because in any hospital you'll see 10 or 12 systems working and you go to an emergency room you have a doctor who spends at least 60 percent of his time keying in the data on a on a EHR it's very complex and even in an outpatient room the, the time is more so I think we need more similar solutions interoperable where data is shared and uh, the ownership of the data is, a, is an issue who owns the data it's the individual so we need the consent of the individual to give them the best. So I think that's something that we should think yeah. about. Yeah. One of the issues that uh, was discussed uh, this week uh, and uh, is being led uh, by the World Economic Forum is beginning to standardize and set international measures of patient outcomes. Uh, and once that's done, that will go a very long way uh, to uh, helping achieve interoperability. There's interoperability is certainly the the, the technical components, yes. but it's also standardizing the taxonomy, right. the language, the patient outcomes, and having shared sets of standards. Well, that's great. Well, let's go to the audience and let's um, see the interest in the audience. I see a hand, but no face, because you're <laughs> not there. Right? You've got one. <laughs> We're going to bring you a microphone. It's, it's a, it, first, I have a thought and then, and then a question uh, sure. for all of you, actually. So I represent uh, the shareholder of the largest hospital chain in Asia. So we have hospitals in Singapore, Malaysia, Turkey, India, and China, and I've been building the chain over the last 10 years. So first, the thought is uh, the general hospital isn't going away. Uh, all of the things that you guys described might happen. It might shrink, it might specialize, but it's not going away. The numbers we ran, uh, particularly in our markets, is if you just look at the demand for healthcare, and you take every supply side disruptive force we discussed and apply it to the model, the demand for healthcare beds is still, still widening, not even shrinking. Yeah. And that's because of aging the population? Aging population, large populations, et cetera. The supply demand mismatch is so big right now that there are people who are simply dying not getting care. So, you know, it's going to it'll increase. So God knows how those hospitals will get built. We'll do our best. So we'd love your reactions to that, particularly you, you guys. I would like to take because I'm from well, let me, Let's just finish the, the question yeah. is, uh, I have a question on the, uh, all of this can be solved and hopefully will be solved with disruption from data, right? Defined broadly. You, you guys talked about a number of things. The question we can't get our minds around is who owns the risk? Because uh, a lot of the technical issues around applying data to healthcare problems are just a matter of time. It's you get the right uh, tools in place, supply the right people, uh, the data collection, the interoperability, all these are solvable issues. The one we struggle with is who owns the risk? Because if you put the risk of self-treatment in the patient's hands, often they don't want to take it. Eh? and They're not even conscious of it. These are very complex issues. And particularly with esoteric treatments, more complexity is very, very hard. And unless we figure that out, where does the risk reside, the disruption won't happen. It's a good point. Who wants to take it on? So I can talk about the first part, which is the uh, shortage of beds. So if you look at it regionally, if you, if you take India, for example, the, the coming in of PE funds, that has changed the game. You see PE funds all around getting into the metro cities. But if you look around the tier three, you don't see any activities going on. 
Yeah, that's what. That's the problem, though. You know, there is a, a tier three. A tier three. It's like the the remotest of the the smaller villages, okay. where there is no data. People don't have access to good quality care. So I think we need to uh, change the model of payments. Now I think in India they're going to introduce the insurance schemes, which is a big, which is going to be the biggest insurance company in the world. So uh, we want to have access to care, which is going to improve, and it's not just mm -hmm. hospitals. We want primary care clinics, a quick reach to a doctor or a, a telemedicine facility. Building just hospitals is not the solution. We're mm -hmm. going to add up to the cost. When you build a bed and somebody walks into a hospital, the cost is going to increase, and we have to address that issue. That's right. I, I would agree with you. I, I recently uh, visited uh, Cuba, uh, which many of you know is about 11 million people, about the size of the state of Florida. Uh, and over the years, the Cuban government has invested in health and education so that uh, every Cuban has a primary care doctor, a primary care uh, center in the community. Uh, and they have health statistics which are comparable with the United States, which is, is quite remarkable. Their secondary and tertiary care system is, is not as developed, uh, but they deliver incredible outcomes uh, for the amount that they invest in, in their health system. That's a system where most of the care is delivered in the home, in the community, and not in a hospital setting. So I, I wonder, as access has improved in many regions of the world that historically has had poor access, whether alternate forms of, uh, alternate, their, their care can be delivered through alternate structures and, and not just hospital beds. And we see that interconnected network of whether it be, in my case, senior care, post-acute mm -hmm. care, Mm -hmm. um, working with mm -hmm. acute care, mm -hmm. which will likely allow us to um, run acute care centers, perhaps with fewer beds, mm -hmm. and more profitably and deliver better outcomes mm -hmm. that are flexible under a variety of reimbursement yeah. models. Yeah, that, that's right. If you, if you look at this purely from a business perspective, the, the, the adage is that if you invest in hospital structures and hospital beds, it's, it's a, a heavy investment in capital and fixed structure. And, and then you've got to maintain mm -hmm. that capitalization. Whereas if you invest in more flexible structures and really invest in the people and the technology who's going to deliver the care, that, that is being proposed as an alternate business model. So I would maybe challenge you to think you about that. Yeah, I'm sure you do. So, well, let's get to the second part of the question because I think it's, it's it's critical. Is that you know we have this data, we're learning from it. Sometimes machines are learning from it, and who's assuming the risk? Yeah, I'd like to address that. Sure. So, you know, I think uh, actually there's a lot of advantage to the fact that there is a fair amount of risk associated with uh, data and AI, AI integration into healthcare. And uh, what I mean by that is. That doesn't means that the physicians aren't going away, right? So, you know, I think we talk to a lot of people who are concerned about the encroachment of robotics and AI on their acumen, on their training. Um, and if we, we're not in a position right now from an industry standpoint, nor from a technology standpoint, to eliminate someone with that high, you know, sort of training and expertise. So, you know, when we think about the business model, though, for at least the foreseeable future, there will always be someone remotely interacting with a patient who has expertise that's connected to a clinical network that's respected and vetted, and that is the organization that's assuming the risk. And you see that even with teleradiology companies who aren't using robotics and aren't delivering care you know, in time. They're reading images, and still there's someone remotely who's taking responsibility and has indemnity you know, to make sure that that result is um, delivered in an appropriate manner and also uh, is reliable. Who's a doctor? What'd you say? Who's a doctor? A doctor or a healthcare provider. You know, I think we, healthcare is very segmented um, and we intend to continue to make use of that segmentation largely so that we can make sure that providers are kind of provisioned as they're needed um, for the right patient at the right time. Um, but it's that sort of physician or provider network that is responsible. So it's more augmented decisions mm -hmm. rather than... Right. right, that's right. So our focus is on how do we use the technology that's available now to augment the capabilities and the acumen of physicians, and we spend a lot of time with physician networks educating them on the opportunity that these technologies prevent, present 
to in increase quality of care, but not to replace their role. Good, I still have a job is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Javier. I work in ophthalmology in Mexico. It takes 12 years of studying to do a cataract surgery uh, in the average uh, country, right? And one of the things that I've seen is that we really want to lower the cost, increase how many people reach, et cetera. Um, and the big, big barrier is the secret sauce of all this <laughs> idiosyncrasy of people that have come through the medical systems mm -hmm. and don't want to use artificial intelligence, don't want to use uh, many of the amazing things that are happening. So how do we need to shift our educational system for doctors to be wired for the future? Because it's not happening. It's a great question. I, I commend you, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, when you think about your 12 years of training as, as an eye doctor to do cataract surgery, um, you had a number of tools available to you during the educational process. Um, and you also had mentors and teachers who helped you learn how to use those, those tools. Um, I think of medical education in the same way, except we're going to have an amazing new set of tools provided by these individuals and others. Um, and we're going to need mentors and teachers who are facile in those tools. Mentors and teachers come in all shapes and sizes. It can certainly be the ophthalmologist who's been doing procedures for 15 years and is, and is very experienced, knows the traditional secret sauce. But it can also be an individual who is well trained in artificial intelligence and knows how to use artificial intelligence embedded mm -hmm. in your medical record system to help you make proper decision making about who are the best candidates for procedures or for this particular individual. What's the, what's the best protocol, the best procedure, and the right set of medications to use? So I just think we have to get clever uh, and be open um, to using all of the, the new tools uh, and data sets going forward. But there is a major historic lag between progress and between changing medical education to reflect mm -hmm. that progress. Yes. It takes time. And at the same time, it takes 13 years on average for 50% of docs to adopt a new technology. Mm -hmm. We are slow yep. and I think I think it'll start. I mean, I, I was talking with the dean of a medical school about how surprised that he was that the incoming class has uh, incredible computer science skills. You know, so many medical school students are in, and they view and the dean has none. By the dean way, dean, <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. They're, they like instead of learning cursive growing up, they're like hacking on Python. Right. Like that's. Yeah. You know, and then and then what happens is you practice, you learn, you see clinical problems that all of a sudden, like you know what, I have a sense for how software can solve it, yes. and I have appreciation how the tools will help me, yes. and it's just going to take time. We just have to wait patiently. Right, but I want to educate the dean as well as the students. Well, yeah. the students. How can, can upward you govern management. something upward that management. you've never seen or understood? Yeah, there's an online pipeline. You're absolutely right, David. Andre. Yeah, a great comments. So I just <coughs> I'm a practicing oncologist. And I have a question that applies across medicine, and I was wondering if you can comment on the ways we're going to move towards reimbursement. We're work, working towards bundled treatment, but as we expand this continuum of care inside and outside the hospital with very different level of specialization of hospital, that's one question. But also within a standard bundle, how we take into account the biological heterogeneity of patients to measure the outcome, and therefore adjust the reimbursement. That's a complicated question. Yeah, Multiple layers to, to that. Um, the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, yes, yes. Well, let, let me just start uh, by talking about financial risk. So the payment model, mm -hmm. going from paying for volume under traditional fee for service to paying for value under a, a uh, paying for uh, outcomes under a value-based system. Um, at least in the United States, uh, there is a slow and progressive movement towards value-based healthcare. There's a lot of geographic variation on how quickly that train is moving. Mm -hmm. um, under the Affordable Care Act, we would say the train has left the station. Now, we don't know what repeal and replace is going to mean, uh, but uh, I do think. I don't think they do either, but. Well, no, that's probably <laughs> true. But, but I think those health systems that have experience with moving towards value-based healthcare and global payments find that the care is so much better that the train has left the station, I and I would include my health system yeah. in, the in that. And the only way to solve the insatiable demands for more beds without more beds is through a volume, yeah. you know, value-based healthcare system. I mean, we, you know, we, we've charged on outcomes. 
from the beginning at Armada. We bill according to the percent weight loss mm -hmm. we get the person to using existing fee-for-service infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we found our customers love it because they know the fees are always proportional to the impact we're having. Um, it also is really interesting from a data side because to your second point, like how do you tailor and adjust you know, based on demographics, but we can actually measure those. We can have, all right, here's the, here's the things that we know from data to, to matter mm -hmm. to a person's success and, and kind of adjust populations, come up with expectations and targets. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll quote uh, Mark Harrison, who leads Intermountain Health, mm -hmm. and uh, during the meetings this week, he told the story about how uh, most of our health systems, we still are partially paid fee-for-service and partially paid global payments but are moving to global payment and are delivering care as if we were all global payment. And Mark said that uh, his board, New Intermountain Health, has set goals around procedures. Uh, and their goal is to reduce the number of tonsillectomies by 50%. That they found their ear, nose, and throat docs were performing too many tonsillectomies. Mm -hmm. So in those areas where there's deviation away from benchmarks, um, you're going to see systems wanting to, to Move, 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 but it's away. also segmenting patients. So, I mean, what you alluded to is that they're more complex patients and they're easier patients. They're patients yeah. who are known to have a worse outcome and not. Mm -hmm. And the better we can find great patients through technology, mm -hmm. the better we're going to be able to do appropriate value-based mm -hmm. care and really move the needle forward because mm -hmm. we're all different. But mm -hmm. the value-based system promotes collaboration. So mm -hmm. think about we care for people with Alzheimer's, very complex mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. Uh, that that live with us, when they land in an acute care hospital bed, they are among the most for for an orthopedic issue. They're among the most complex cases for a hospital to manage. So we are establishing relationships between hospitals and our facilities to manage those individuals. And it's early days, but perhaps we'll be sharing in that bundle. We're a yes. private pay model. We, are, we do not get reimbursement from Medicare or in most cases there's very little private insurance. But we're moving in this direction. I would say technology has a role to play in this also and, and you know, to your point about having to do more procedures than you need to, using technology to get better estimation of what the treatment plan should be looking at people who had the same um, issues life. before, yeah. right? And then I would also say for repeatability. So in the ultrasound space, there are a ton of ultrasounds that are done uh, again and again because the diagnostic endpoint can't be reached with the first image, right? And that's the case across imaging. So how do we use technology to enable value by uh, you know, using data analysis, using artificial intelligence to better interpret uh, results? I think you talked about oncology, which is very interesting because uh, oncology in UAE is different from oncology in the States because mm -hmm. the genetic setup is different. Mm -hmm. And we try at least three different combinations before we realize that it's mm -hmm. working on the patient. So I think mm -hmm. we need to be talking about precision medicine or personalized mm -hmm. medicine. We need to be compounding uh, DNA, mm -hmm. mapping. So we need to reduce the wastage. So I think we need to come up with uh, universal health records where we share intelligence and mm -hmm. no longer Anymore. Share? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll share the profits as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, in the back there. Hi. Um, um, Wait for the microphone one sec because they're recording. Hi, Sue Valeriot from San Francisco, and I please appreciate uh, your um, w work with the older people. As I have two 87-year-old parents who I play catching when my dog walks through and knocks them down. But on the other end of the spectrum, at Brigham. Uh, the Brigham Women, are they looking at technology maybe moving women, the only healthy floor in the uh, hospital, maternity OB, out, say, with uh, ultrasound and data from Mr. Duffy and throughout the trimesters, and then the risk involved that he brought up with moving them out of the hospital and home births, I don't even know. Is that, is that a plan for the future? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we used to deliver 10,000 babies a year uh, we now deliver about 6,000. Uh, and those 6,000 are primarily women at high risk and, and part of our maternal, maternal fetal medicine program. Many of the babies who are delivered end up in our neonatal intensive care unit. So we, uh, in the tertiary center, it's, it's referral risk, high risk, uh, and uh, sick babies. Um, our normal births have, by and large, been moved to our community hospitals. Um, and whether um, 
anyone is interested in Call the Midwife, uh, circa <laughs> uh, 2016. Uh, I'm referring to the PBS series on Call the Midwife. Yes. Uh, it's a charming program about midwifery in, in East London in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, who knows? Um, you know, I would ask a tool. He has studied childbirth in India uh, in very rural provinces and has shown that if you can institute a checklist of um, very, simple, uh, very simple parameters, that you can actually make childbirth much, much safer, uh, even conducting uh, at home. Yes, I'm so I, I didn't see back here. I apologize. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Deb Restaurant, Cornell Tech, and OpenM Health, which sort of gives away my line, uh, which is that I know you all suffer from the silos that your major EHR providers gave you and makes it hard to do the interoperability. And we now, and you've all referred to the wonderful work that's coming along that you can do from data from the individuals. And Atul was talking to Collins about this yesterday in his interview, saying now we need a science of how to interpret these data. It's not going to come out an app by a time at a time, and we can't leave it to Almada to have to invent every digital biomarker that's going to work for them. So what can we do to have the mobile and the digital and the IoT delivery of that data contribute to science to give us something more like the internet and less like our siloed uh, <coughs> EHR system? Um, you know, I think we've uh, all experienced here at the World Economic Forum, the ability of the world community to come together to solve common problems. Uh, and I would suggest that, that this is a common problem that is worthy of, of the international community coming together to, to solve. Data standards, data standards, data standards. Yep. Yeah. We all talk different words to describe it. So if you're calling a broken leg, you're calling it a fractured leg. No matter what technology you have, it's very hard to harmonize the data sets. There's six major ones that exist in the world. Some leadership has to go forward and just say, hey, we're doing this. And people will get upset, but the field will move forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Oh. Well, well, I'm, just throw it. Yeah, I'm <laughs> home, uh, with Home Instead Senior Care, and you know, obviously with the surge in the aging population, to me it seems as though the <laughs> two most scalable assets we have are family and home. So you started the session out by imagining what the hospital would look like in 10 years. How do you imagine expanding a family's capacity to care? How do you imagine the home? What would it look like? What would be there to help you accomplish health care? That's a really, really great question. Uh, I can only speak to an experience we've had over the past year where uh, a group of our internists, fresh out of their medical training, um, have set up a home <coughs> hospital program uh, as actually a, a randomized study. And they took individuals who came into the emergency room with pneumonia. And they asked them to participate in this study. And they were randomized to receive care for their pneumonia in a, hos a traditional hospital or at home. And uh, as part of the qualification for entering, uh, they had to have a certain functional capacity and they had to have uh, a support system with certain functional capacity. So you standardized that across both groups. Um, if you were in the hospital, you received this, the standard care, antibiotics, that, yeah. If you were home, uh, you, had, you were rounded by your internist in the morning uh, and uh, accompanied would be a nurse practitioner or a PA. Uh, the, uh, you know, essentially get the medication or whatever. Uh, a nurse or, or equivalent would come back every eight hours, so they visit three times over the 24 hours. Uh, and the care was both for the individual and the family to help. The family has to be present to help instruct. Uh, and uh, at the end of the randomization, uh, the early results show uh, that the time to feeling well again was shorter, that um, the patient reported outcomes, the patient experience was much more favorable, the family's re experience was much more favorable, and the cost was markedly reduced. And the food was better. And the food was better, <laughs> yes. Well, 
On that positive note, we're ending the hour. Yeah. Um, and I, I thank you all for participating. It's been a remarkable group of panelists. And I think the exciting thing in today's Davos, this is actually a positive session. I think we all had a positive outlook of what's going on. And certainly, we need to bring it to that, some of the other disciplines. And I thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.